Hey everyone, welcome to Bible study once again this day, and uh, we're thankful to have you with us and happy to join with you. Our readings this week are, are good ones. They're, they're neat ones from the book of Isaiah and the book of Matthew. Once again, we're going to focus on those two readings, and uh, there's a lot there. Uh, we'll, we'll try and pull out some connections for you and some neat things to think about as you ponder these readings over the next several days. But for now, why don't we open with prayer, and then we will move right into Isaiah 51. So if you'll join with me. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this chance to be together. And Lord, we ask that as we continue to journey on in faith, that you would continue to guide and lead us and continue to send us back towards you, Lord, as we continue to lean upon you and your word. Help us, Lord, to clearly hear all that you offer for us this day and help us to understand everything that you provide, all the blessings and the wonderful uh, gifts that you provide to us each and every moment. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive everything that you provide this day. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to be working on... Isaiah 51 verses 1 through 6 and before Pastor Eggle reads this I think there's just a few things of context I'd like to share. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the book of Isaiah but it's one of the longest ones in the Old Testament. It has 66 chapters and when you look at those chapters uh, there are some topical themes that divide the book up so that you see some big um, sort of like scenario scenes together. And one of the things that makes Isaiah such a profound book is just how much he covers, not only in his writing, but his time span. And so you've heard us talk about this a lot, just how, how many years Isaiah covers. And one of the things I want us to see is that uh, one of the sections that we're dealing with is the middle section, kind of chapters 40 through 55. And what we're dealing with here with Isaiah is he's really uh, declaring a word for the people who are going to be in exile in the upcoming years. And so when you read it with that context, that really gives mm -hmm. you a, a great um, understanding that God is preparing his people and he's preparing them to have things to get them through some difficult times. And so mm -hmm. I want you to see that and hear that as we read that. Any other thoughts, mm -hmm. Pastor Eggle? No, I love the way that you, uh, I love the way that you phrased that, that he, he's preparing them for uh, the exile for a time when they will be, when they will certainly feel lost. Yep. Uh, and the way that he prepares them is with promises. It's the mm -hmm. same way he prepares us for times of exile, times of right, uh, right. uncertainty. Amen to that. And, uh, and so the, it's just a great introduction to this reading. Yeah. And as you hear Pastor Eggold read here in a moment, think of some of the images that the Lord brings up, especially if you think about the past history of the Israelites. See what he latches himself to and what stands out to you. We'll pull some of that out. Pastor Eggold, we'll follow your lead here. Great. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 51. Listen to me. You who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. 
but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will never be dismayed all right that's it yeah that's good yeah this is uh there's just so much imagery here that uh, it almost overwhelms the mind as mm -hmm. you you process this and so maybe just going back to verse one for a second here we hear sort of a distinction being made. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness. And, and these are the ones that are going to be listening to the Lord. And, and in our understanding of the context of the exile, listening to the Lord really is understanding that they, they are going to endure this exile. They shouldn't mm -hmm. fight against it. Mm -hmm. We've looked at that before. Uh, and, and so it's time to, okay, understand that this is where we're supposed to be. This is where the Lord wants us, but he's going to see us through it. And so that's an important aspect is this is who uh, we're talking to or, or hearing being mentioned at this point. What, what stands out to you, Pastor Eggold, in some of these images yeah, well, that come out? Verse 1, yep. the idea, uh, you know, this rock Mm -hmm. quarry idea um, that you were um, created you were a people mm -hmm. made by God, found by God mm -hmm. you know we had the a few weeks back the parable of the treasure hidden in the field right? where, yeah. the, where the man digs up the treasure and, right. and in a sense you, you hear similar language that right. the, the, the people of God have been created uh, from the rock mm -hmm. and the rock, I mean you, you know that's that's Christ's language. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We hear that repeatedly through Scripture, right. New Testament and Old Testament. And um, so I think, you know, there are also, um, I think there are, are baptismal connections in a sense. Yeah. They yeah. You know, look to the, the place where you were given right. identity. Look to the place where you were given life. And, and so we, we look back to that objective right. gift right. of God in the, yeah. in the sacrament of baptism. No, those are great points because I, as you said that, I kind of think of a, a new term for a Christian as a chip off the old block sort of idea, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the idea of baptism that's a little bit, you know, you think about that. And I think of, you know, the baptismal fonts, the ones that I really stand out to me are those sturdy rock-like ones that really, again, emphasize this imagery that you're pulling out. Yeah. So very cool. Um, I think, too, as you talk about that identity, the, the aspect that they didn't form themselves that right. you're, you're hinting at there too that uh, the Lord was the one who called them out who chose them who who created them formed them he makes that even clearer yeah. with Abraham and Sarah he says you know look at look at Abraham you know he was one and now right. he's many you know how right. how massive uh, of a difference is that not because of Abraham because obviously Abraham messed it up the whole time as he was trying to cling to the Lord's promise. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make it happen on his own terms, and that didn't go well for him, but right. the Lord made it happen on his timing and his terms. Yeah, so. the only thing Abraham had yeah. was the promise of God. Right. So yeah. it's this idea of the people of, of promise again. Exactly. The, the promise to those yeah. in yeah. exile, in right. uncertainty. No, it's, it's very, and again, a familiar promise, one that's been with them down through the ages, not just yeah. something that comes out of nowhere and so when, when you look at verse 2 I want you to always connect yourself back to Genesis 12 uh, Genesis 12 1 through 3 you can look it up on your own time but you're going to see a very similar language and what's really neat then is to see again the God who is here speaking through the prophet Isaiah is the same God who called Abraham and, mm -hmm. and while we, we might take that for granted it's always good to see that and be reaffirmed of that and see the continuity of scripture throughout so take a moment when you have a chance to look at genesis 12 1 through 3 verse verse 3 and 4 here in our text from isaiah 51 uh, start to change the imagery a little bit uh, i think verse 3 is neat because you get emphasis back to creation mm -hmm. Uh, you see even Eden mentioned, uh, the Garden of Eden. And, yeah. you know, the Lord, again, is promising this restoration to something that, you know, they had been taught and told about down through the ages through what Moses had written, that, you know, Eden was this perfect place. And here we see, again, the Lord promising that that's going to be uh, the restoration that he brings to his people once again. And mm -hmm. I think that's uh, a huge picture but a huge comfort to his people who 
uh, have grown up with this history and know what's going on in there. So any thoughts there, uh, Pastor Edwin? No, it's, it's, it's a great um, example of transformation. God mm-hmm. takes what is not yeah. and, and creates something. He brings life out of death. Right. All, yeah, the, yeah. all of those things that, that yeah. you're pointing to. And um, I think the way it opens, the, the Lord comforts yeah. Zion. Um, you know, we, we read that as it's not just a, a historic reference. It's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that the Lord comforts his church, that the Lord still right. Right. brings life out of death. The Lord still mm-hmm. turns waste places into gardens. And, um, and the result is joy and gladness, thanksgiving and song. Gotcha praise yeah, yeah no, that's very good very neat one of the other things that stands out to me and i'm going to jump ahead a little bit here is uh, the language of god always talking about his arms you know that just i don't know stands out to me as he uses language that personifies himself mm-hmm. especially at this time in a way that would relate to the people foreshadow you know mm-hmm. his incarnation and really just emphasize you know this idea of the Lord's strength. You always see the strength in the Lord's arm. With The psalmist, you know, sometimes talks about that with the way he would um, lead the people of Israel through the sea, you know, with his mighty arm or with mm-hmm. his mighty hand. And, and you get that sense again here that the Lord's arms have not grown weak. And that's what he emphasizes a little bit here to his people, that yeah. uh, he's still in control. Yeah. Uh, even in the midst of what's going to happen, uh, he is the Lord over the chaos, the exile that they're going to experience. And that image of his arms still stands true even at that time. Mm-hmm. It's good. So. Well, and it's interesting, too, when you think about, when you, and this is an important way to always read the Old Testament, is that you read it through a Christ-centered, yeah. Yeah. or Christocentric is the, the theological word yeah, to right. use, Christocentric lens. And to understand that he will set his justice as a light for the people's, and that his arms will judge the peoples. Mm-hmm. And even further down, uh, my righteousness will never be dismayed. All of those mm-hmm. are references to the, the justice, deliverance uh, that he will bring through the cross. Right. You know? right. Um, so what, what, it, what, is, what do God's arms look like in judgment? They, mm-hmm. they're, yeah, that's a great They're point. nailed to a cross. Yeah. So... You always, always place that Christ-centered lens on top of the Old Testament because you'll be amazed at how often you you see the Old Testament, kind of like you said earlier, uh, pointing ahead. Yeah. Well, and you even wore your bow tie this time. Today. I did. Yeah, I that, did indeed. So we can uh, right here emphasize that a little bit. I like that. Yeah. yeah. That's our that's our model for teaching uh, the purpose of Scripture is yeah. our bow tie model. Yeah. Yeah. It ties in nicely with that lens. You you touched on that last phrase there, uh, the, my righteousness will never be dismayed. Yeah. And, and if you back up just the phrase before, but my salvation will be forever yeah. and my righteousness will never be dismayed. I think what a great promise. And I think, you know, as we look towards our gospel reading, there's mm-hmm. a chance to see some connection here as you, you'll hear Jesus make a wonderful, comforting statement about his church mm-hmm. uh, that is timely at any moment, but especially I think as we face the times that are coming for us ahead. So hearing this promise here that the Lord speaks to his people through Isaiah in their time of exile and turmoil and and understanding God's consistency, his continuity, that he's never going to um, fade away, that gives us a great chance to jump then to our gospel reading and see that comfort come through even more Mm -hmm. through Jesus who is God in the flesh and so any last things that we want to talk about here do you think Pastor Ogle? No you pointed this out earlier yeah before we turned the camera on (laughs) and we were talking about this this chapter in Isaiah yeah the, Yeah. the idea that it comes between two servant songs right I thought that was an interesting placement for this text mm-hmm. and the, the servant songs there are four in Isaiah right. and those four servant songs all point specifically to the Messiah I mean right. they go beyond the 
the Christ-centered illusions that I pointed out today, they are the voice of, of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of these servant songs you would recognize right away, but in between these two servant songs, in 50 and in 52, 53, you have this promise of, uh, of comfort, of salvation, uh, of righteousness. So, and, and obviously, as you're, you're, you're drawing out, that's not by coincidence. Right. You know, it, it's certainly something that we see that the Lord's comfort for his people is intimately tied to the servant who, mm -hmm. you know, replaces Israel in terms of obedience and uh, willingness to do what is asked of him and really yeah. then leads us out into a new Israel, as we talked about in baptism, as we're joined to that servant through his suffering and death in yeah. many ways. Yeah, that's good. So, no, I, I mean, I, I oh, keep talking point. about this for a while, but yeah. I think that gets us where we need to be for sure. the day. Well, our gospel reading then for this week comes from Matthew chapter 16. And this is a passage, I think, that has a little bit more familiarity to us than maybe some of the other Matthew passages that we've dealt with in the last couple of weeks. Um, it's one that we see Peter again, and I think that's an important thing. Uh, we see Peter in a different light than sometimes we often see him pictured. And it's a helpful thing for us to, again, watch the journey of faith for these disciples. And we're going to see that come through uh, with Peter to an extent here and now. So we're going to read uh, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. Okay. It's going to be hard not to keep going. I know. Yeah, and we'll have to talk about it, I'm There's sure. Plenty, for a plenty here, though. Yeah. Uh, so starting at verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. All right. There's some neat terminology in here that maybe we should yeah. unpack for a second. And the first word that or phrase that comes to mind is the Son of Man phrase. And perhaps you've picked this up as you've read through some of the Gospels or maybe even as you've heard us talk. The Son of Man is one of the ways that Jesus will refer to himself. But at this point, he's testing his disciples or at least asking them, okay, who do people think is the Son of, the man, son of man? And that reference has really got to... A link back to the Old Testament with Daniel. It has a really messianic sort of concept behind it, this idea that this is the Savior, the one who has been promised to come, the Son of Man. And so when you think of this question, this is what Jesus is asking. You know, who do you think the Messiah is, is partially what he's really getting at. And so notice what they answer. Uh, they know what people are saying. They know what people have said. There's different groups that have different ideas. Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah. Great uh, prophets throughout their time, great you know, preachers of God's word, and really you could see why people would say, okay, these are these this could be him, yeah. you know. But uh, at the same point, then you see Jesus sort of change this question. I think the way he asks the next question is very, very critical. He says, who do you say uh, that I am? And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, there's a parallel sort of being drawn. Okay, here's the Son of Man. He asks about that. Who do you say I am? If Jesus is claiming to be the Son of Man, what does that mean for 
his disciples, and that's what Peter confesses. And I think that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind, that Jesus' questions are, are very interesting when you see them side by side. It looks like you've got yeah. so well, I just share. Yeah. Uh, if you have a Lutheran study Bible, on page 2098, there's a, a section with the heading New Testament Names for God, and one yeah. of them is son of man and the note says this is a favorite designation self-designation it says of jesus he uses it 80 times in the gospels wow. yeah and then it says it's almost never in the rest of the new testament but it kind of it builds on what you said you know yeah. the meaning can change depending on the context but that you know this is jesus would refer to himself as the son of man and it has connections to uh the Messiah, and, mm -hmm. and this note even takes it back to, to Isaiah. Right, right, yeah, no, that's, good. Good, that's good stuff. So that confession comes out clearly for the first time, you know, through Peter's lips, and this, this is an important thing. So he takes what Jesus has already sort of prepared them to understand, that he is the Son of Man, and he's pushed it forward to say very clearly, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, really a, a powerful statement to say that you know here is this man in the flesh is the son of god that's something that would be blasphemy to a lot of people mm -hmm. but here uh, again jesus not only affirms that but yeah. goes forward with yeah. this confession and i think that's a big thing and i do you want to say a few things about peter's confession here there's a lot here that i think would be good for us to well that's really interesting out. and i yeah. i didn't think about this when we were talking prior to the sure. recording today, but yeah. um, just a great um, connection back to the Isaiah reading. You know, he says, and I tell you, yeah. you are Peter, and on this yeah. rock I will build my church. There and you so go. you started the Isaiah reading yep. with, uh, look to the rock from right. which you were hewn, yep. and here Jesus gives that title to and this is a great, yeah. This is an important, uh, thing. An important point. Not to Peter the person, right? Yeah. But to the confession of Peter, yep. which is a confession of Christ as Messiah, as Son of God, right? Um, so no, I think I think I never had made the connection textually before mm -hmm. to to Isaiah, but uh, that's a that's a strong thing. And then I, I think also the um, yeah. uh, I always. You know, you don't have stage directions in, in the Bible. <laughs> you're, if you read a play, it'll it'll give you stage sure, directions. It'll sure. tell the actors yeah. what to do. But I I, I wonder, you know, between uh, verse 15 and verse 16, did he say that immediately? Uh, did yeah, Jesus right. just put that out there and then watch him squirm? And finally Peter answers, we don't yeah. know. We yeah. don't have that yeah. stage direction. But uh, nobody else even... Uh, dares make a, a comment. You know, when you teach a class and you ask a question, everybody <laughs> puts their head down. Not uh, Peter. Nobody wants it. Not Peter. Peter <laughs> steps up and, you know, we know people like that. Yep. Um, sometimes we are people like yeah, that. Right. But uh, I thought that was, that's a, a, an interesting detail that leads up to the confession. Mm -hmm. no, I um, think that's a great Anyway, point. I'm kind of all over the map. but No, no, I think those are neat things. And uh, it really is helpful to think about that, too, because you have what we heard from Peter, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, he's the one that, again, cries out to the Lord, if it is you, you know, tell me to calm out in the water. And yeah. so you, you think, okay, Peter's got great faith. And then all of a sudden he's sinking and he's afraid. And all of a sudden that faith is dashed. And here again, you see just the ups and downs of faith, especially yeah. Peter's faith. And I, I think that that's such a gift for us, again, to watch yeah. this man, we might say struggle, might blunder, whatever we want to say, but we can relate to that. We can see that, that how easily sometimes things are so clear, and then all of a sudden the next second, it turns around. And, and right. you mentioned this beforehand. We'll, we'll get to some of this text in a second, but if you look just to what is to come, yeah. you, you get Jesus foretelling his death and resurrection, and all of a sudden Peter's great confession of faith turns into... Uh, a misunderstanding of what the Lord's purpose and mission is. And right. again, this faith just, it's a roller coaster ride. Uh, and right. the only thing that keeps you, you know, stable and founded is again, Christ. It's not, you know, what you do, but the, the stability is again, that Peter can, can cling to Christ in the midst of the ups and downs he, he goes through. So yeah. I think that 
that is something that we don't want to pass over as we think about this from our own personal perspective. So, yeah, that's because that's us. Yeah, I mean, exactly. We, we can quickly go from a, a clear, strong okay. confession of faith to a, a, a statement or a, an action that speaks against right. Christ. And right. That's, that's what you see in Peter. But that's for another day. Yeah, that will be. <laughs> Just wanted you to see it, though. That's it's good. Sure. Well, you have to see it. Yeah. yeah, I think it's important to point it out because yeah. the contrast is is just so bold, yeah, dramatic. Well, I'd like to dig in for a few minutes on verses seventeen through nineteen and just sort of pick out a few things as we go through. And the first is a very simple, practical thing. Sometimes people read Simon Bar Jonah, and you might wonder what the heck is Bar Jonah mean. And if you have a study uh -huh. note, it gives you a great answer. If you don't, then you might be sitting there wondering, you know, is this the new bar in town or something? You know? <laughs> uh, when, when you see this phrase, this this comes from the Hebrew, Bar Jonah means son of, son of Jonah. So Simon, son of Jonah is what Jesus is doing, and he's referring to him that way. And mm -hmm. so just so you don't get confused, and maybe you never knew that before, that's what that phrase is referring to. Well, it's interesting too. Why would you know? Why would he need to say that? I, they're, I yeah. They're, they're in this fairly small group. Um, it's just the disciples at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think that highlights um, the divine revelation aspect of this. You know, you're a son of of a person that's very not yeah. son of man in the way that i talk about myself but son of jonah yeah and yet you know this uh -huh. well it wasn't because yeah that's great flesh and blood revealed yeah. to you your dad didn't tell you this right jonah didn't sit yeah. you down and uh this is revealed to you by my father right right yeah uh, and that's a cool cool con uh the yeah. context for this yeah i never thought about that before and it's an important point that you're making here too is that as we see throughout the rest of scripture uh, the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, or that he is the son of the living God, is not something we come to by ourselves. You know, you pull out yeah. the, the third article, uh, an explanation from Luther. You know, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But, you know, this confession that Peter makes is not something that he thought about really hard, and all of a sudden he was able to reason himself right. to this point. Right. And that's... That's what we see about faith all of the time. It comes from hearing God's word, from being shared or revealed this knowledge through what God has already given. And so I think that's a critical point that you're making about this distinction between him as a son of a human father yeah. who has been given this gift from his heavenly father. Yeah, so that's good. Verse 18 is, is not only critical because we talked about the rock imagery and who is really being referred to or what, yeah. as we should say, uh, being referred to. But then what, what comes after that is important, too. I will build my church on this confession, you know, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and then the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That doesn't mean they're not going to try. But here we have what a firm promise. You go back to that Isaiah mm -hmm. passage again, that his salvation will be forever, uh, that his righteousness will not be dismayed. Here, Again, we've got this promise of God's longevity, everlasting uh, characteristic that comes through here. And really, I pray it gives you comfort to know that even in yeah. the midst of these times, whatever we face, whatever might be coming against the church and attacking it, will not overwhelm it to the point that it's uh, going to destroy it. Yeah. It might change it in the sense of how we operate, but it will never take away this confession and I think that's such a wonderful powerful thing to cling on to for the rest of our lives that's great the last thing and if you don't mind just mentioning a little bit on this is verse 19 there's some important things what what's being talked about there pastor Edward? What, yeah so this is one of the primary texts that we turn to for the doctrine of the office of the keys right yeah and that's that's one of those um, topics when we give that topic to our confirmation students they, they kind of their eyes get big and, <laughs> what what are you talking about the office of the keys it's but your office right it's my you office know, you know, no the it's the 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 keys to the kingdom right um the, the to, to to be in the body of christ and um in his heavenly kingdom is to be forgiven and that's the power that the that god has given to the right. church right and so yeah. that's 
Um, one of the key mention, mentions of this, you, you hear it again in John's Gospel right. at the end yeah. of the Gospel when Jesus comes to the disciples after the resurrection. Yeah. Um, but that's the job of the church. Right. We talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and there are times when the church proclaims law, but it's not for the sake of law. It's for, for the sake of being able to then give to a repentant sinner who has been convicted by the law the forgiving gospel of Jesus that gives life, that does all those things mm -hmm. that Isaiah talked about. Right, exactly. You know, yeah. Streams in the wilderness. Right, uh, right. Life from death. Uh, that's what the gospel does. That's always the job of the church. So that's, to me, that, you know, every time I read this passage, I, I think about that that forgiveness aspect. Yeah, and I think that that's crucial for us to, to understand that, you know, the purpose of this confession of Christ leads to that forgiveness, you know, and then yeah. those two go hand in hand. Yeah. Now, we can't not wrap up without talking about this oh, last no. verse because it it catches you off guard after he praises Peter. Then he goes and says this to the disciples. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anybody. And I, <laughs> it's a know, that's strong language. He strictly charged yeah, yeah. the disciples. I would. I wish we would have had that in here. What did that look like? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a strong language. Don't tell anybody yeah. that I'm the Christ. And and it's it's interesting because um, in the section that Pastor pointed to earlier, the next thing he says is, you know what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. You know what being the Christ means? Yeah, right. That I will go to Jerusalem, uh, suffer, and die, die yeah. and be raised on the third day. And uh, that totally goes over their head. You mm -hmm. know, that's why Peter responds in the way he does. But um, at this point, why doesn't he want people to know? Well, I think part of it is, is you know, his fame and his, you know, the people around him, not not just the 12 disciples, have really looked to him as sort of the new leader. Um, and and the, the misunderstanding is that, again, that the Messiah was to be a ruler here on earth yeah. to take away the adversity that they are dealing with, particularly the Romans. And so... Um, this misunderstanding of the Christ, the Messiah, would lead to a different outcome, I think, in the people's minds. They would have probably taken Jesus and forced him, as best they could, uh, to overthrow Roman tyranny or the kings that they didn't like. And yeah. that's not what he's there for. And that's why looking at that next section is very critical for us, yeah. I think, too. No, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, at this point... Um, his time has not come. Yeah. And and as you look ahead in Matthew, you start to see everything pointing toward Jerusalem. The transfiguration of Jesus happens in 17. Uh, the, the teaching that takes place, the miracles that take everything is moving right. at this point toward the confrontation in Jerusalem yeah. uh, that leads to his, his death and resurrection for us. It's interesting to go through this during this time of the church year because you know you think of this stuff as we build up to Lent and Easter right. to, to rehash it once again is great um, as we're in this time of the church and yeah. to be reminded you know what are we founded upon as we you know dwell in this time of church is important yeah. so it's good excellent well why don't we close with the prayer that's on your your sheet there we're going to close with just a little summary of this this passage and uh, that'll be a good time for us to wrap up please pray with me Grant us grace, Heavenly Father, to confess Jesus, and so remain on the unshakable rock of our salvation. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Have a great week. We'll see you Sunday. Bye.